Okay, all you Hebrews, we're ready to get started here. Uh, Magni, I bet there's 70 or more people here. That's about what the nation consists of. How many of you have heard the expression, land of Goshen? Yeah, well, that's where we're coming from tonight. We are, uh, the land where the Hebrews had settled in was called the land of Goshen, and from there they were taken to the promised land. We're so excited about Brother Magni coming and leading us in this time together, and I know you want to be in prayer for him. But before we do get into this, and Tony's going to come up and lead us in this song, did any of you have a prayer request for tonight? Yes, ma'am, what you got? Or Angie? Okay. Pray for Angie. Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Keep in mind, Joan Reeves, pray for her tonight during this time. Kenny's here, praise the Lord. He's got his hand all bandaged up, but he's here with us. Anybody else? Yeah. Yes. Barbara Hardy went to the hospital, so let's remember, pray for her as well. Anyone else? Amen. Miss Lola. Yes, ma'am, I remember that. Uh -huh. Let's definitely be praying for her. Anyone else? So I want to remember in prayer. All right. Well, we're going to go to the Lord in prayer, and let's pray together. Our gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for this time that we can come together. And, Father, just kind of take a bold new look at a, at a story that we've heard all our lives. Father, in this story, it's you, sovereign God, you who could see beyond our vision, and our knowledge, Lord, you direct our paths. You lead us to places, Lord, of uncertainty and unknown. And, Father, with confidence, we could boldly go forward. With confidence, as in Hebrew says, Lord, by faith, we can do things knowing that you are in charge. I pray, Lord, for special blessing upon Brother Magnus this, this afternoon, Lord, as he comes and shares with us from his heart what you have laid on his heart, Lord, to share with us. We have Tony as he leads the music. Jonathan as he is the youth. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Okay, so we've got a, a, a projector set up here, so we won't be putting the words up on this particular same song. So I'd like y'all to get that little red book. Let's all stand because this is going to be the offertory hymn. <laughs> We're going to do number 67, Blessed Be the Name. Oh, for a thousand songs to sing, blessed be the name of the Lord, the glories of my God and King, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name. Of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Jesus, the name that charms our fears, blessed be the name of the Lord. Tis music is the sinner's ears. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name. 
blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. Good evening. Uh, I, I really want to take this chance to tell you that since Barbara, we came here, I wanted to have this chance to say that Barbara and I are so happy to be back home with our uh, family, our uh, good friends, and the people we love. And uh, I want to tell you that uh, really need to know that from the first moment we stepped through that door, we could feel God's presence and the blessing in this church through every one of you, through the pastor, the deacons, the teachers, and everyone. And what a blessing. And the important thing is we are, Barbara and I are so grateful that you allowed us to be a part of this blessing. So thank you very much. Uh, I, uh, I know we know most of you and you guys know us, so I really will take a minute to introduce ourselves just in case, right? My name is Magdi Gerges. I belong to this beautiful young lady there, Barbara. Barbara is a Broadus girl. She was born and raised here in Broadus. And uh, this week we celebrated our 45th anniversary. Actually, uh, Tony sang, you guys sang for us this morning. But uh, anyway, we actually lived the first 25 years of our marriage right here in Broadus. And we attended this church. Well, uh, let me rephrase this. She attended the church I kind of these days, right? <laughs> anyway, uh, I'm originally from, uh, from Egypt. I came to the States in 1974. And uh, by the way, I was uh, naturalized in 1978. So I'm telling you this so you can all relax. I'm legal, all right? <laughs> but uh, before we go any further, I really want to make two points very clear. Any notes? So I'm going to tell you what the Lord's put in my heart. So I'm going to ask you to bear with me if I get in any senior moments, all right? The second thing is I am not a theologian. I'm not a pastor. I'm not a scholar of any kind. I'm definitely not, not a doctor like uh, Brother Winky calling me. I'm a retired United States Merchant Marine. I was a ship's captain, and I spent all my life at sea while Barbara was at home Raising the children, taking care of business, paying the bills, and doing all that good stuff. So, so I was at home sailing my ship all over the creation, but she was really the anchor holding the family together. And I want to tell you really that it takes a very special woman to marry a sailor. <laughs> all right? <laughs> I love you, sweetheart. <laughs> anyway, I think we better go in the Exodus before I get in myself in trouble. You know, the Pastor Wynn did a great job taking us through the whole thing. Uh, it was a genius way, uh, really. But uh, so uh, you all know the Exodus and the story of the Exodus. So I'm not going to waste your time and go through this. But what we're going to do is uh, we're going to talk about the part of the story that was left out. That's why uh, Barbara, that was actually her idea, she suggested that we borrow uh, Paul Harvey's slogan, the rest of the story. And I thought it was a good idea. So what we're going to be doing is jumping back and forth through the whole thing, so you need to hang on with me there. But whatever we do, we're going to do something that you guys done, did in this church all the time. Everything was done here as was for the glory of God. And that's it, all right? Anyway, a uh, couple of, not long ago, I read a small article in the paper, and uh, it was about Exodus. 
and he, the writer said that there's no historical evidence of any kind about the Hebrew being in Egypt or in Sinai. And concluded the article that the whole thing is a myth and the whole Bible is nothing but just a bunch of fairy tales. I'm not going to waste your time, my time because this is nonsense. We don't have to even, no response from us. But what I say this, if you can think of those two points and take them with you, is, uh, and we're, we're actually going to be addressing them slowly. Just imagine how can a group of men, uh, mostly fishermen, all uneducated, write a book that becomes world bestseller of all times. And if that book was fairy tale and, uh, and nonsense, how come they are so scared of it? All right? So this is, this is my answer and no, no more than that. The thing about it, here is uh, this picture here is uh, of uh, Sinai. Sinai is part of Egypt and uh, been a part of Egypt since the days of the pharaohs. And if you look clearly at the picture, it's uh, like a triangle su surrounded by salt water from all directions. And inside, in the land itself, there's not a single river, there's no lakes, there's not a single tree. All what, it's a huge place, 23,000 square miles. That's why the Hebrews were lost for a long time there. And all what you find there is sand, rocks, and the only thing maybe snakes and scorpions. So that's why most probably the Hebrews were so mad at Moses all the time to get them out of Egypt, put them in that miserable place. But anyway, we're all familiar with those two maps and uh, the route of the Exodus. And we see them in every Sunday school, every room. But uh, I think really the name should be the suggested routes of the Exodus. Because if you see the lines there, there's so many different colors and all this stuff. Because nobody really knows which way the Hebrews took. It's all speculation. And I believe, my opinion, there's a couple of reasons for this. When the Hebrews left Egypt, they lived a nomadic life. What I mean by that is they lived in tents and they kept moving from place to place, most probably following water, like the Bedouins who live today. That's what they do. So they didn't build any villages or cities or anything like this. When somebody died, they didn't build a tomb. They just buried a hole in the sand and they buried the person in it and they kept going. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us that even when they built an altar to the Lord, all they did is they put a few rocks on top of each other. So by doing this and this kind of life, how can you expect historical evidence after 3,500 years? You should, people should use their common sense, you know. And then the other thing is uh, the names in the Bible. The names in the Bible are also 3,500 years old. And anybody that knows a little bit about the history of this part of the world, they know that this area has been invaded by different countries, different cultures, different languages. So the names have changed all by the time. And these names in the Bible doesn't help us much at all. So that's why the confusion we have now. So what I'm trying to get at is this. The Lord put these stories in the Bible for a reason. Kept them for us protect them for us generation after generation for a reason, and then gave us the part of the story that we needed to know, no more, no less. So I believe that too much speculation is not really a very good idea unless you specifically said it is a speculation. And uh, so I say we stick with the Bible and yeah. forget about all this. So what I'm saying here, in the, uh, with the story here in the Bible in, in Exodus chapter 3, he said that Moses was taking care of some uh, sheep for his father. His father was uh, the, pa the, the priest of a place called Midian. Midian was in Saudi Arabia. So immediately some people say, okay, the whole story didn't happen in Sinai. It was in, in, in Saudi Arabia or in Midian or whatever. So anyway, the rest, the same, the other part of the, st of the verse said, and he took the flock west. The important thing is he came to a mountain called Horeb, and he named that the Bible tells us that this was the mountain of God. It was specifically said that this is the mountain of God. And that's where Moses encountered the, bur the burning bush. Uh, if we fast forward to chapter 19, we know Moses have, was in Egypt. He got the Hebrews out. And they've been two months already in the desert. And he came to a place, you guess as good as mine to, to, to pronounce this, but it's a Rephidim. Barbara and I have been trying to pronounce it for two days. But anyway, whatever it is, the freedom, whatever you want to pronounce it, but they camped there for a little bit, and then they, they broke camp, moved a little bit, and they camped again right there at the base of Mount Sinai, and the name was said, 
And that Mount Sinai, the Lord came and Moses went up to see the Lord. So there is a specific place that's been mentioned twice. Mount Sinai, the Lord came to Mount Sinai and, God, and it was called Mount Herod, uh, Horeb. Uh, the, the people who lived in that place for thousands of years named that location Gabal Musa, means Moses Mountain. It had been named that forever. And uh, so, uh, Bible scholars now tell us that Gabal Musa or Mount Sinai, that's actually Mount Sinai or, or, or Mount Horeb. Uh, this is a very famous place now. It's big for tourism for many reasons, but one of them is at the base of this mountain, there is a very famous uh, monastery called St. Catherine. The reason is one of the oldest in the world and the most famous. And there are a few reasons for this. If we go closer, with a closer to look at it, you see that there is a chapel inside, and they call that chapel the Chapel of the Burning Bush. It was built in the first, in the first uh, century A.D., this chapel is almost 2,000 years old. But what made this place, later on they built a monastery around it, but what really made this place very famous is in 1844, they found, accidentally, they found a Bible in that, in that place. Actually, they were going to burn it. They thought it was trash. And then they discovered it was a Bible. And when they took that Bible and they looked at it, they found that they discovered this, that this is one of the oldest copies and the most complete copies of the Bible in the world. It was smuggled from Egypt to Russia, and then uh, later, in later years, the British bought it from the Russians, and now it's in display in London in one of the museums. But what is important for us here about this Bible is this. This Bible was written, handwritten, or hand copies in Alexandria, Egypt, in the year 200 AD. So that Bible is about 18, 1900 years old. And actually, that Bible silenced all the critics about the, the, the Bible critic that they always say that the Bible had been tampered with or changed or we converted to the way we like because this copy of the Bible is identical to the Bible that every one of us is reading today. All right? Okay. So another thing we need to know about this place, you see that little white building? And this is a little bit history about Egypt. Uh, you know, Egypt was a Christian country originally. And, uh, and I'm, of course, proud to say that was, I was one of the originals. Christians of Egypt. My, fa my family were there. We never converted. My family they were never converted to Islam, but many people did. But anyway, in 642, the Arabs invaded Egypt. And we know when they were spreading the, 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 the Islamic State, they were pushing, they were using very simple rule. Convert, submit, or die. And that was the way they spread Islam all over the world. And, and what other thing they did is they convert most of the churches to mosques. And they're doing that, in the, by the way, all over the world today. So when they came to Egypt, they converted some churches, and some they didn't, but what they did is they came right next to the church and they built a mosque and uh, to overshadow the church, actually. So they came here in this place, and they built the mosque inside the monastery right next to the church. That's a little cold, isn't it? But anyway, so... Whatever the story is, whatever what happened, this is part of the history about this area. But uh, whatever or where it happened, uh, where the Lord met Moses, it really doesn't, not essential. But all we know from the Bible that the Lord appeared to Moses at the burning bush. And he told him, I felt the affliction of my people in Egypt. And he told him, I want, to go, I want you to go to, Mass to Egypt, to Pharaoh, with a message from me. Let my people go. This was not a suggestion. This was not a request. That was a command. Let my people go. So Moses went, went to Egypt, uh, went to Pharaoh, and uh, delivered the message. As soon as he delivered the message, we all know the conflict started between Moses and Pharaoh. And every time Moses delivered the message, we know the, heart, the Lord hardened Moses' heart, and the Lord immediately hit Egypt with a plague. And we're not going to go through these plagues. You all, I'm not, like, we all know it, so we'll just go through them quick. It started with the blood, and then the frogs. Then came the gnats. I mean, one after the other just kept coming. The flies after that, and then the livestock died. After this, the, uh, the people had boils all over their bodies. Uh, hair came over. Lo locusts uh, came and ate all the crops of Egypt. So one after the other, then darkness came. One after the other was hitting Egypt. So, you know, one after the other. And every time, and the Bible tells us, five or six times, and the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. All right? 
And then, after all this, the Lord sent Moses to the Hebrews to prepare them for the big one that's about to come. He told him to get a spotless lamb, sacrifice a spotless lamb, and get the blood of this lamb and paint the posts and the lintel of your door with the blood of this lamb. That became to known after that as the Passover. The Passover became one of the biggest feasts the Jewish, in the Jewish calendar, but also they celebrated it every year and became the base of the entire sacrificial system of the Jewish religion. They follow it every year after that because there's a command in the Bible, I think in Exodus 17, that they're supposed to follow it every year. So they did every year religiously, they really did, until the Roman destroyed the temple in 70 AD and the sacr sacrifice stopped. Uh, but what the Hebrews didn't know that sacrifice, the Passover and sacrifice by do by sacrificing the, 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 the spotless lamb and by celebrating the uh, Passover, they were actually setting the stage for the coming of Jesus Christ, the, per the perfect sacrifice that the Lord will send for our sins. They really didn't know that, but it was happening. And you know, uh, John the Baptist, when, when uh, Jesus went to him to be baptized, what did he call him? He said, behold, the Lamb of God that come to save us. So he called him the Lamb of God. So what we see here is the Lord had been really planning for this from way before Jesus came to us. I believe it was even planned from the day you and I were kicked out of the Garden of Eden. The Lord had planned that. And, then, and the Lord knew that the blood of a lamb, the blood of a goat, the blood of a cow or a chicken will not do that job. It has to be the blood, the blood of his own son. And that's why the Lord had this plan in action from day one. He planned the time for it. He planned the whole thing for it to, 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 to go there. So at that night, the firstborn in every house in Egypt that didn't have blood on the door died. So Pharaoh called Moses and told him, take your people and get out of Egypt. Pharaoh left, uh, Moses took the people and head toward the Red Sea. And we know the story how he was trapped there and the, uh, Pharaoh changed his heart, chased him again. And here again, the people start speculating again. Some people said it was a hoax. Some people said it never happened. Some people said it was not the Red Sea, it was the Sea of Reed. Some people said it was only a swamp. Some say it was a wind from the desert. Some say it was a tsunami from, the, from whatever. Everybody come up with a story. They draw different maps. The last I heard that was very interesting, there were some divers diving in the Red Sea, and they found a chariot wheel. So they said, okay, we found where the Hebrew cross. That was right there. I, uh, when I was talking to Barbara, we, we started laughing about it because Barbara had been in Egypt, and she knows the, the, that anywhere you dig in Egypt, you find this. You dig in Egypt, you find bones, you find wheels, you find uh, uh, mummies. So <laughs> finding a wheel in the Red Sea it's a joke, you know, it doesn't tell you anything. So, again, I want to go what, by what the Bible say. We need to stop this speculation that doesn't make any sense. Uh, Brother Wayne, about two months ago, three months ago, he talked about this right here. And I remember clearly he said something about when a train and brought us here a few minutes, you cannot walk in the grass, you get bugged in the mud. Remember that? Yeah. So, what I'm telling you is, right here it said that those people walked on a dry ground. Their feet didn't even get wet. They had two walls of water in each side, one in the left and one in the right. Uh, uh, swamps or a sea of reeds will not build a wall that's enough to kill an army. So what we need to know, like I said, we need to stick with what the Bible says. So, uh, you know, it is, it is clear and it's all what you have to do is to open your heart, understand what the Bible is trying to tell you. Uh, we believe that the crossing of the Red Sea is one of the biggest miracles that happened in the Old Testament. It's a very massive one. But I'm going to tell you about a bigger miracle than that. Uh, you know, if you go in Genesis 17, the Lord had a covenant with Abraham and his descendants. And uh, the, the Bible tells us it was everlasting covenant. I don't think we even need to say everlasting because... Every time the Lord opened his mouth, it's everlasting. It's, no, it's binding. They don't need to say that. But it is everlasting. It was a covenant with, with, with Abraham and his descendants. In this covenant, he promised them a few things. 
He told him, you're going to be fruitful. You're going to have uh, uh, increase your number, and your huge number. You're going to be a big nation. You're going to have kings coming out of your nation. And also, I'm going to give you the entire uh, land of Canaan. This is going to be yours. All this you can have, but I want one little thing from you and from your descendants. And actually, this came first. It was in verse 1. He told him, all I want you to do is acknowledge I'm God Almighty and walk with me and be faithful to me. That was not too much to ask. The Lord always kept his word and he was faith, faithful to us. We never had been faithful to him. We always slipped and we always went to the other side. So it didn't work like this. So we'll see now how the Lord kept his word with those people. And that's actually, I believe, was a bigger miracle than crossing the Red Sea. The... Uh, the story of the, of, the, of the Hebrews in Egypt started with the family of Joseph going to Egypt. That was the family of, of Jacob, 70 of them. Uh, when we studied the last, uh, last three months with Bill, Jim Bill, this, uh, the, uh, the story of Joseph and um, Jacob, we knew that this was a broken family. And we'll come to that later. Joseph, uh, Jacob's family was totally broken family. He was a deceiver when he was young. The, the boys were all... Uh, doing whatever they want to do, no control. So it was a broken family. We can get to that later. But the Lord took those people, sent them to Egypt, Egypt for a purpose, and in Egypt they got, they were put in the best of land they were given to them. He was building a nation. The numbers start increasing. The, the, like what the Lord promised, they were fruitful. They start increasing. Actually, they were increasing like rabbits. And that's what scared the Egyptian most probably. I don't know exactly that the Bible doesn't say that, but that's what I think. If the whole number increased, that maybe the Egyptian got scared and said, wait a minute, those guys are going to be more than us. They're going to take over, right? Maybe. That's a guess. So anyway, uh, after they got increased in number, the Lord grinded them, hardened them, pruned them through slavery. Somebody think I'm crazy to say that. But believe me, that is what can harden people. If you don't believe me, go watch the movie Spartacus. This is true. There were 3,000 slaves. They put the Roman Empire on their knees. 3,000. 3, they were all slaves. They were all hard as steel. And that's what happened to the, the Lord did here. When at God's good time, 430 years later, 600,000 men went out, all as hard as steel from slavery, went out and ready to take on the whole world. Those people were freed from slavery by the grace of God. It was by the grace of God they freed from slavery. It was by the grace of God they left Egypt. But unfortunately, they became slaves and their hearts and the back of their heads, they would start crying and whining and, and, and all this stuff. And I'm telling you, frankly speaking, we have people like this right here today in America. We have people like this everywhere in the world. But here, you know. That people have been slaves and been freed, but they're using that for a crutch because they don't want to work, they don't want to do anything, and they want the government to handle, to feed them and take care of them. And those are that never will get out of this slavery. They are going to, they're both, no matter how free they are, they're born slaves and they're going to die slaves. And that's what happened here. The whole generation failed the test. And not a single one of those people reached the promised land. They all died in the desert with the exception of Joshua and Caleb. Okay? Uh, let's shift the gear a little bit now. We know, so let's not talk about Egypt a little bit. You know, when I talk to Egypt to somebody, immediately we talk about this, the pyramids or this and that, but really, there's a lot to know about Egypt besides the pyramids. Egypt is a very, very old country with a very old and massive civilization that, believe me, it goes back maybe 7,500 years or more. Very, very old country. And the civilization was so massive, Egypt was a world power like the United States today for almost 3,500 years. You know, the United States is world power now, but the United States is only 243 years old. It's a baby compared to Egypt, right? Now, over there, it was 7,500 years. And the reason for Egypt to be, a, there's few reasons, of course, for Egypt to be a world power. Number one is the location. If you look at the location to the country, the country was naturally protected, and of course, relatively speaking, to those days. And the north, there was the Mediterranean Sea, and the east, the Red Sea, 
And then the west, there was the western desert, which is go all the biggest desert in the world, go all the way to the Atlantic. And from the south, black Africa. So the country was protected. There were no danger of invasion from anybody. There was only one vulnerable, vulnerable spot right there in, in the east of Sinai, this little spot there that was vulnerable. We know from studying the history in Egypt, the Egyptian, ancient Egyptian were great builders. Those guys built huge pyramids, massive buildings, and, and, and the structures they built was absolutely massive. But for some reason, they didn't build a wall. <laughs> I had to, I'm sorry, I couldn't help it. <laughs> I couldn't help, that's it. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> and I'm telling you it was a big mistake because if those people had remembered to build a wall, that civilization would last another thousand years, no problem at all. Because right from this area, right from this area, we had, Egypt was invaded by the Assyrian, the Babylonian, the Persians, and the, and the Arabs. And it was not only an invasion of an army. I'm telling you, it was not. The invasions with this army was followed by mass migration, and, uh, and those people changed the fabric of the country. Religion, of course, when the, when the Arabs came, they brought Islam, the Arabic language, the Sharia law, and all this garbage that came to Egypt, and the civilization was totally destroyed. All right? So that is from this side of the fence, as this side of the story. But anyway, but why is it Egypt is important to us as Christians? You know, Egypt is mentioned in the Bible over 800 times, or 840 times in King James, you know? And Egypt is the only country in the world that was visited by the Lord. Jesus didn't visit any other country besides Egypt. Egypt's doors was always open to the Jewish people. They were always welcome from day one. Whenever there was a famine, or there's some trouble, or there was whatever it is, they're threatened, that they always went there, and they were always welcome there until 1956 when we were ruled by Nasser, and the, you guys know the story. But all this history from day one until this, uh, this history, the, the Hebrews were, were welcomed in Egypt. Uh, <coughs> Egypt was mentioned in the Bible the first time in Genesis 12, when Moses took uh, his wife Sarah, and he took her to Egypt, and actually he gave her to Pharaoh as his sister. And then again, it was mentioned in, uh, chapter 50, uh, in Genesis 15, uh, when the Lord had his covenant with Abraham. And he told him, you have your descendants, and your descendants will go to Egypt, to a foreign land, and you're going to be slaves for 400 generations, or for 400, for 400 years. And then you'll come back, after, the, after this year, you'll come back to Canaan, that's the land I gave you. But you'll have to wait there because... The iniquities of the Amorites is not yet complete. And, and when I read this, I really got confused. I, what is the Amorites has to do with the Hebrews being in Egypt? And so I really looked, and I couldn't find, so I said I better go back all the way to the beginning to see what those guys, so hang on. We have to go all the way back to Noah. Noah, we know, had three sons after the fall flood, and the middle one, his name is Ham, had a son, his name is Canaan. And the Bible tells us in Genesis 10 that Canaan was the father of the Amorites. Later on in the stories, when they go to the story of Joshua, we know that the Amorites were concentrated in a city called Jericho. And we know that when they, before they go to Jericho, they, uh, <coughs> in the book of uh, Joshua uh, chapter 2, uh, he sent two spies and they almost got caught. So there was a girl there, or a woman there, by the name of Rahab, helped those, Jews, those uh, spies to escape. And later on, she lived with the Hebrews, married a man, his name is Salmon, and they had a baby, they called him Boaz. I guess you're guessing now which way I'm headed, all right? Uh, and then we go to the other boy, his name is Shem, he had Terah, and then they had three boys and a girl, and one of them in the corner there, Haran, had a son, his name was Lot, that was Abraham's nephew. And we know from the story of Sodom and Gomorrah that he, his wife died when they were escaping. And his, he went with his two daughters in the wilderness, one, uh, two nights and drunk, and they slept with him. And one of them had a son. He became the father of the Moabites, and the other one had the son of the uh, Amorites, Ammonites. And 
the Moabite girl boy, in the, when, you see, when you read the book of Ruth, we know that this Ruth came from this line. She married Boaz. And what from there we have Obed, Jesse, David. And from there we have the Lord. I am not trying to outguess anything, but all I'm trying to show you here is something very simple. Nothing happened without a reason. Nothing. Everything happened in this life, there is a reason behind it, whether good or bad. And what we see, and that is really even from the crucifixion of the Lord, Jesus Christ, we just talked about that this morning. Jesus Christ came here to be crucified. He came for that reason. From all the way from Jesus Christ, all the way to the little bird. You know, from the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, like I said, it was not an accident. And Jesus told us that even the little sparrow will not fall from the tree without God's knowledge and God's protection. So what is he telling us here is God is in complete control. And that is what we call divine providence. So, and, you know, uh, like I say, it has always had been planned from day one how it was going to work like this. And the interesting part now, or you can say God has a, a sense of humor, is that even the Lord sometimes used people, uh, you know, uh, crooked people or, or, or uh, imperfect people with bad plans to go with his perfect plan. We see this story clearly in the story of Joseph. So quickly, if we go th through the story of Joseph, Joseph had, you know, we know that, as I said earlier, the family was broken. Jacob was, was, uh, was, was uh, all, you know, it was a mess. The boys were doing what they want to do until the Lord finally blessed him and do did, did, did. But in the family, if we see here, here, he preferred one boy over the others. He gave him clothes or more than the others. And he let him spy on his brothers. And that made him hate, the, his brothers hated him. And it actually got worse than that when Joseph started having dreams and that the whole family is bowing down to him and they're worshiping him. So they hated him more and more and more. So they finally decided to kill him and then they changed their mind and they sold him. I want to tell you something here. In my family, uh, I have three brothers, so we have four boys, no girls, and I was the youngest. And I know many times I gave my brothers a hard time. I caused them a lot of problems. And believe me, they made me pay dearly for it, all right? <laughs> but, but I tell you, there was not a day I felt that they wanted to kill me or sell me or get rid of me. As a matter of fact, when I, when I had a, got in trouble with anybody else, they were the first people to support me against anybody, uh, you know, when we were kids, right? So that's why I said there must be something very wrong with those people, but it is God's plan. No matter what it is, it was God's plan to go with this thing as the way it happened. So we know later on that, Jesus, uh, that, uh, uh, Isaac, uh, that Joseph went to Egypt and he was sold. And the, he, uh, uh, with the wife of his boss there, got him to go to jail. And then with the cup bearer and the baker, that was a way for him to go to the palace, interpret the, the, king's, the, the dreams to the king and, and the pharaoh. And he, all of a sudden, became the big hunter man in Egypt, right? And he brought all his family all the way to Egypt. Here's something that we need to think of. Joseph lived there, and the Bible tells us that he married an Egyptian woman. And from this Egyptian girl, he had two sons. Was, uh, here's a good question to think of. Was Joseph wrong to marry outside the Jewish race? You know, it's very clear that the Bible was so clear that they should let Anna marry with anybody else. The actually, the answer is no problem whatsoever. This is just a trick question, you know, <laughs> because the law was not even there yet. That law came by Moses 100, 500 years later. So there was no law to marry anybody. Actually, they were marrying, the, the men were marrying any culture, any, any, any. Actually, that was uh, from his father. You remember the story of Abraham, his great-great-grandfather, Abraham, when Sarah couldn't give him a son, so she married Hagar, and from Hagar they had uh, Ishmael, and then they, Ishmael became the father of the Arab nation. And uh, now we, I want to take this chance actually to correct something, a big mistake or, or big, uh, uh, you know, many people say the Egyptians are Arabs. And this is from what you saw a while ago, this is a big mistake, because Egyptians, we are not Arabs. 
I was actually our women so proud to be pretty like this. They're proud of how beautiful they are and the proud of their clothes. And the, they never look like mummies like this. This this culture and this uh, veil that came from the Arabs came from the Shia, uh, the, the Sharia law that came to Egypt. They start dressed like this and they start do that. So that was so Egyptians are definitely not an Arab. The uh, the other uh, question here to think about is also. You know, the Bible tells us that during the seven years when Joseph was in, in power, uh, there was lots of food. So he took the food from the people and he stored it. But when the famine came, what he did is there was a famine also in Egypt. So the first year, the Egyptians went to him for food. He took their money. Then the second year, he took their land. The third year, he made them slaves in their own land. And, and uh, then after that, he made them sla uh, slaves. Sorry, he, he, you know, he went with the process. First the uh, money, the livestock, the land, and then he made them slaves. So the question here, was Joseph just to do this to the people that opened their home and the land? Remember, I'm Egyptian now. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. No. <laughs> Actually, Brother Wayne answered that question this morning again. He answered that question very clearly. It was in Genesis 50, verse 20. That was God's plan to save everybody because to start with, who are we to decide to, to argue about God's will? The second thing is, the, if he didn't do that, the Hebrews were going to die and also the Egyptians were going to die. So the plan was God's plan to save everybody. That's why it happened this way. So there is no discussion about it. Uh, if we're talking about the Egyptians and the Hebrews, we know how the Hebrews, how they believe. I think we should understand something about the Egyptian religion. The, <coughs> the Egyptian religion was a real complex, very, very compli complicated. But uh, uh, the, the point about it is those people were so religious. And I will tell you with no reservation that I believe that those people, it was a wrong religion, right? But I believe they were more devout, devoted to their gods more than the Hebrew were to Jehovah. They were so strict and so devoted to the religion. The whole entire civilization and the whole entire culture was based on the relation to their gods through the pharaohs, because the pharaohs were gods. They, uh, they have, I don't know how many gods they have, but I'm sure they have hundreds, had so many gods, and each of these gods was a divine representation to something that was so important to them in their life. They believed in life after death, and they also believed that death was a short transition from this life to the afterlife that was everlasting and it was phys phys physical. So what they did is from early age, they, they, con they concentrated on, the, on that and they devoted most of their resources, their time and their energy to prepare for the day they're going to die. They were very serious about it. Uh, they also believed in uh, judgment after death. This uh, picture here, is the papyrus. Uh, the papyrus is the paper the Egyptian wrote in. This, uh, they invented this paper. They made it of a papyrus reed called papyrus reed, and it was invented about 5,000 years ago. But uh, they wrote this one. This papyrus is a copy. It's 3,500 years, and it represents the judgment of a person died and how he was judged. So, like I said, it's very complicated and very long, so I'm going to go very, very brief about it just to give you an idea. This person died, and he was, his spirit, which they believe it lived in the heart, was going to go and be judged according to 42 laws. They call them the 42 laws of Mat. Mat was a goddess, one of the goddesses of the Egyptians. She was the god of truth. And she was depicted as a woman with an ostrich feather in her head, and this feather represented the truth. This, the spirit of this man will go and be uh, judged according to 42 commandments, and they will go in front of 42 divine judges. Everyone will ask a question from those 42. Did you kill? Did you steal? Did you commit adultery? Uh, did you uh, abuse your land or you uh, abuse your animal, mistreat your animals? 42 questions of this kind. And, the, and the, this person, the, the spirit actually answering now the question. This is all after the man died. And, the, and they will be answered one at a time. Then. They will go, they take this, the, the, the spirit will go to be tested in a scale against this feather of this, uh, the feather of the truth. If 
the man was lying, he's destroyed for life and he's lost for life and he will never, he will be lost. But in this story here, the man wasn't lying, so he will be led to live for eternity in the afterlife with Osiris, which was the god of the dead or the afterlife. And that's where he will be happy. But the point about it is, he, this, like I said, it's all physical. So to be, to, for him, this case, the spirit will have to find the body, so to go back to the body, which that's why they mummified the body. The body was mummified, and it was put there in the, in the, in the <laughs> all right? <laughs> and the, the body will be, so the spirit will go in the body and will go to the afterlife. Also, they were supposed to take, they can take their toys with them. They can take their money with them. They can take their gold with them, the food they like and everything. That's why they build the big pyramid. And that's why they build this massive tomb to hide the bodies in it, to hide the mummies in it, and to hide the gold and treasures and the things so they can take it with them. Those people didn't remember, you know, of course Jesus wasn't there to tell them that you cannot have treasures with you here on earth. In Egypt, there's 138 pyramids. Not a single one was found intact. Every one of them was stolen, clean. So that really proved that Jesus, when he said that, he knew what he was talking about. The, uh, if I said that the, Hib the, the Egyptians were uh, religious, I said they were very religious, they have temples everywhere in Egypt, vary in size, shapes, and everything. Uh, they, 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 sorry, in size. And the point about it is those people, they didn't pray on Sunday. They prayed seven days a week, twice a day. That's how s serious they were about it. There, there was, I don't know if you want to call it a mass or what, but it was going on nonstop in the temples continuously. The temples are built, like I said, in different sizes, but mostly the same shape, and you can see them all with the same design, and, uh, but they vary in size, and you have the procession road to go inside, and this is the design of the, of the temple. And if you look, there's a procession road, if the with the, uh, the God, the statue of the God will come through that road, and then we'll go through, uh, this is outer court, then they go to the inner court, and after you go to the inner court, you go to a place they call it the Holy of Holies. So the statue of that God, which is a solid gold statue, will be coming from the Nile in a boat, and be carried on this box, gilded uh, box, gold-plated box, would carry it by the, the priests, by handle, and they go through the whole place, go to the Holy of Holies, and only the high priest can go in. He'll take the statue from, the, from that box and put it, place it in, the, in, in that place. Many people believe that the, fair, the ancient Egyptians worshipped these statues, which is true in a way. But, but the real thing here is this. They really didn't worship that statue. That statue was there to tell them, I am your God, with a small g, and I live here. So remember, I live here with you in this Hall of Holies. Does this sound familiar to us? It sounds very familiar, right? So anyway, I want to stop Egypt now and let's come to the America today. We jump so quickly here, just for a minute. The, you know, we are, I'm sorry to say this, I've been here 45 years and, and I really sad to see the country in the shape it is today. It's very sad. The country is totally divided and there's a battle going on between left and right and this and that. And mostly people think it's, it's, it's political. Uh, Republican against Democrat, liberal against uh, conservative and whatever. But, but really, if you look in the bottom line, the battle actually is between good and evil. Between God and his angels against the devil and his demons. And the, devil, the whole thing has been cam camouflaged in all what we see today. The, the whole thing is... From day one, the devil and his de we know the Bible tells us this, that the devil is for real and the demons are for real. The Bible tells us that for sure. It is not a segment of our imagination. It is true. And his biggest trick that we were told a million times in the church, he's trying to tell us that he does not exist. And uh, from what is this? From day one, from day one, from the time that Lucifer turned his face away from God, he had been trying to counterfeit religions to, 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 to compete with God, create his own religion, left and right. Now, they have in this one here, and we see that here in the States, what we call the new here in the States, they call it the new age religion that's going like fire in the United States, really big time. And, it, and, the, and the target now is our children and our grandchildren. And it's very, very serious and very dangerous. 
The point about it is, it's reaching our homes, it's in the schools, in the universities, and sad to say, in many churches too. All right? So that being said, let's go back to the, our story. You remember we said many times during the plague that the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. Why did the Lord do this? Why would the Lord, why didn't he just let the people go? Why did he harden, was he competing with Pharaoh? Who is Pharaoh to God? It was just a mere man. If God could have let, let Pharaoh, okay, let the guys go and he didn't have him, suddenly let him take his, his people and leave. Before we answer that question, let's go back just a little bit to the beginning here. The first encounter between Moses and Pharaoh, what did he do? He took his staff, threw it on the floor in the palace, and the Bible tells us the staff changed into a snake. And what did Pharaoh do? He called his magicians, they rode the staff, and it changed, it changed to a snake, right? The same thing happened with the first plague. Moses, uh, <coughs> excuse me, he changed the water to blood. Pharaoh called his magicians, they turned water to blood. So what was going on? Actually, the Bible tells us that magic and magician. What I'm telling you right now, I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not contradicting the Bible, but I want to tell you this. There is nothing called magic, and there is nothing called magician. It doesn't exist. This is word we invented. Those people were priests. They were priests serving demons, and they were serving Lucifer, serving the devil. And if you don't believe what I'm saying, you can read the verse in Ephesians. He said, for our struggle, is against the rulers, the authorities, the power of the dark world, against spiritual forces of evil in the dark realm. That is what the fight was. The Lord was not fighting with Pharaoh. The Lord was fighting the devil. He was trying to show the Egyptians and the Hebrews that I am. That's it. Nobody else. It's I am. The thing about it, that's why the Bible was so, con so strong for, to tell us against all this... Uh, uh, magicians, the witchcraft, the fortune tellers, he said, it is, we should never approach this because it's all from the devil. And he actually clearly forbid us from going in that direction because it's coming from the devil. The, uh, it, is, it is very well known to us now through the Bible that the devil, it was all his life, his, his, his goal was to imitate God. He wanted to be like God. So if we look at Isaiah, five times in chapter 14, he said, I will be like God. I will, I will go into, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the skies. I will sit above the congregation. I will ascend above. I will be like the most God. Over and over and over, the devil was trying to be like God. And actually, uh, he tried. If you, look, if you look at what he did, we have in, in our, in, uh, for Christian, we have, we have the Holy, Holy Trinity, the, uh, the God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. What did the devil do? In the, in the, in the book of Revelation, we read about the unholy trinity, the devil, the Antichrist, and the false prophet. We talked about ago about the temple, and I ask you, it's very, very close. The two temples are very close to each other. So he was trying to imitate God. But somebody might say, but wait a minute. The temple of Egypt was built 1,000 years before the temple of Jerusalem. But the devil himself was there a million years before that. He knows exactly what the design was. All right? And then here's another thing. You know, when the story, when the Bible, when we talk about in the future, the, the, the four horsemen of the apocalypse, what was the first horse? He said the Antichrist was riding in a white horse. In chapter 19 in Revelation, Jesus will come down riding in a white horse. So what I'm telling you, he's trying to imitate Jesus all the time, and the whole thing was imitated. We talked a little bit before about the moral code. And, and I tell you, that moral code actually what made Egypt, even though they worship a wrong God, but living in a good, good morality and they had good, strong morality, that was one of the reasons why Egypt lasted 3,500 years as a world power, because they lived with a moral code. And if we study history, and we should, if we learn anything from history today, we will know that most of the major civilization, when they start falling down, the first sign was the decline in morality. And I pray to God that this is not happening here in the States because we are, our morality here is going in the gutter. And that is how we need to wake up to, to this. The, uh, <clears throat> in 1901, there was a French uh, archaeologist in Iran, today's Iran, 
and they were digging in a place called Susa. If you read in the Bible in chapter 7, I believe, where, where uh, Daniel had the vision about the goat and the ram. They were digging in this area, and they found this stone, uh, about seven black stone, about seven and a half feet high, and uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's just like an index fin finger. And where the nail is, the, there's a, a, a picture of uh, a king sitting down and a, a scribe standing next to it. And there was a lots of writing on that, on that uh, stone. They took the statue, sent it to France. It took them a year to translate it. And after the translation came, they found out that this is the oldest law in the world. They called that stone the Code of Hammurabi. Hammurabi was a king, lived in this area, 1800 BC. So that stone is almost 4,000 years old. This law is the best law ever written by man in the old days and the first one. Actually, the law was so good to the point that we have some of these laws applied right here in America today. One of them, for example, is you're innocent unless proven guilty. It was in that stone. It regulated the relation between a man and his family, a man and his business, a man and his slaves, a man and, you know, all, the, all kind of work. Actually, an eye for an eye and tooth and tooth was also in this one. So it was a massive law that was perfect, perfect for people to live by. But the point is that law was secular law. Both those laws were worldly laws, man-made laws. Brother Wayne, the other day, told us about a week ago or something. We had, we, I remember your words very well, and sometimes I copied them while you were talking. <laughs> he said, we can never legislate people's hearts. And that's why these two laws, they were man-made, they were no good. Even though they, the civilization lived with them and went with them, they collapsed. Because we can never live, it's not by our work, it's by the grace of God through our faith. That's how we can survive, that's how we can go. These man-made laws will never take us anywhere, no matter how good they are. The, the thing about it is, and why, why other people and other religions having difficulties with Christianity, is they really cannot make a connection between God's justice and God's love for us. They, this has to be a gift from the Lord for us to understand. The Muslims won't understand this, and many other religions won't understand this. Definitely they won't, because how can you connect those two? But the, the thing is, it's so clear and so simple, and thank the Lord that the Lord opened our eyes to understand this, because God is just. If he's not just, he cannot be a good God, and that's why he demands he demand justice, and he demands atonement for our sin. And then because of his love for us, he provided the atonement for our sin, and that's what he did right there. The point is how he can get those two together. There was only one way to get those together is at the cross. At the cross, he managed to get those two, satisfy his judgment with his love for us, and at the cross where those two met and the Lord atoned for our sins. And that's why Jesus rightfully so, so said, and he had to say it with big, strong mouth, that I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father but me. People don't ever understand that, and people now saying, no, no, that cannot be. There's many other ways to, to have. And that is, that's it. So anyway, many people think that when this happened, the story of Egypt was over. But it's not really. It's not over yet. The Lord was not done with Egypt at all. What happened is, if we read, there's a big prophecy in the future about Egypt, and, and Isaiah prophesied. There's a chapter, a whole chapter, chapter 19, is about uh, prophecies in Egypt. And he's saying that the Lord, the, uh, in, the, in the chapter 19, he's saying that the, uh, the Lord will ride against Egypt. And, uh, and the God of Egypt will, 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 will die of fear. And the Egyptians' hearts will, will melt of fear. And, and that did happen. I'm telling you, prophecies happened. And that the Lord came against Egypt. And when he came against Egypt, he sent, like I said, all these armies... He sent the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Arabs, the Greeks, the Romans. One after the other came against this civilization that was one, the biggest and the strongest in the world. And when the Lord was finished with Egypt and with this civilization, it was finished, buried in the sand. And when I tell you it was buried in the sand, I mean literally it was buried in the sand. Everything we find about ancient Egypt today, we dug it out of the sand. The Lord, that civilization totally vanished. But the thing about it here is how good 
God we have, how, how, how good he is. Because later on we read that the Egyptians repented. And the Lord is not only forgave them, but he blessed them. And this is something that is, you know, after all this, they were forgiving and they were blessed. The blessing came here saying, and the Lord I will bless them saying, Blessed ye Egypt, my people. And that was the last verse in chapter 19. And then, as you read after that, Assyria, my handiwork, Israel, my inheritance. And this was a really surprise to read because those two, three countries that hated each other from the dawn of history, from day one they hated each other, from day one they fought with each other and killed each other. So how, uh, how come this happened all together like this when we had the Egyptians that turned their face away from God, worship other God? The Assyrians were so cruel, they are actually ancestors of the ISIS today and with the Israelis who uh, crucified Jesus and they don't want Jesus, uh, they don't even admit about Jesus today. So how come those people are being blessed like this? If those people are blessed like this, in one verse, do you think we have a hope for us today in America? You know, if you look at what we're doing today, we worship other gods just like the Egyptians. We became so cruel, we're killing our babies, and we are killing each other in the streets like it's free. And then we, have the, we turn away our face from, from God, and we don't want nothing to do with Jesus or God, just like the Israelis do. Do you think we have hope? The point about it is, we, it is by God's grace we had the freedom we have today. Our, the forefather of this nation knew this, and they put it down, they put the foundation for this that we have, free, we live under in this country. This is the foundation, the country was built on Christian foundation. That's the freedom of religion, freedom of thought, and freedom of expression. We have to live this peace. And this is a treasure, you guys know. It is a treasure, and that's how this country became great by. And I tell you, the sad part is our enemy knows it. Our enemies are here, and they know the United States is so powerful, they cannot fight you with guns, they cannot fight you with tanks, because their country is so powerful. And the only way to beat and defeat the United States is from within. And they're working on it, and they're doing a very, very good job, and unfortunately, we're letting them do it because we are silent. And that's, we need to stop that. So, we got a warning, we got a warning in 9-11. And the warning was, and we people, when 9-11 happened, that was a warning. And everybody was singing that verse in a church, in the street, and everybody was saying, but six months after, we forgot it again. And we need to come back and go back to that. And because without the Lord, without the Bible, I think we have no hope. And that is our hope. Thank you so much. Yeah. Let's all stand together, and as you took in what he shared with you, the people were delivered out of a physical land, but they also were delivered out of a spiritual bondage. You and I, before we accepted Christ, we were in that spiritual bondage. You could be free in Christ, and yet your mind could still be enslaved. That's right. And so, if you've got anything that you would like to bring to the Lord. We're going to have a time of invitation. Tony, if you would, come on up and, and share with us uh, in music and uh, anything you want to pray about. Something's going on in your life, something going on in the life of one of your family members, someone you want to pray for. Let's take it to the Lord. Let God bring you out of the land of bondage even today, right now, as we go to the Lord. Heavenly Father, I pray, Father, as we look upon this presentation tonight, that we'll allow your words to touch our hearts. That, Father, it's not too late for us to change things in our lives. Father, you know that I've been dealing with some couples, Lord, that are going through some marital struggles right now. Father, you know the situation I found myself in just a few days ago with a couple, Lord, that 
now decided that divorce is the, the only way to go. Father, I've talked to a couple, Lord, that lost a baby. They're only six weeks old, Lord, and that baby was tragically lost. Father, we've seen in the news yesterday two young children were killed in the backseat of a car when a tree fell on them. Life is so unpredictable, God. And I pray, Lord, that you'll help us to see it. And, Father, that we are calling on you, Lord, to be the Lord of our hearts. Father, to be the Lord of our hearts. To place our hearts in a right relationship with you. That we will have no trouble with our fellow man. That we can live, Lord, above the hate and the frustration and the mistrust, Lord, that's in this land today. So, Father, you be our God. You help us to see our own ways, Lord, and anything we need to change, help us to change it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. And oh, to Jesus I surrender. Trust him. 